Hi, we're going to talk about assembling stone and cutting stone products of different thicknesses. Of course, you might have an inlay where you've come along and you've cut a, something out, and maybe this is an inch and a quarter stone, and you're going to come along and you're going to put a, a 3 8 marble inlay here. Now, the eye will only see a flat surface at the top. You don't know whether if this was stainless steel, if it's a sixteenth of an inch thick, if it's stone, if it's three eighths or three quarters or inch and a quarter, and even if it was inch and a quarter, it might not be inch and a quarter. It might be just a little bit broader, wider than that, so that means that when you come to put it all together, you certainly cannot work off the bottom as being your guide. Uh, what's important is, what we would do is we had actually a large sheet of glass uh, on a table that we made a frame for underneath, so it was well supported, and then we would take our stone and we would place it upside down. So we've got the polished surface on the actual table. Now, as long as you've got a flat piece of glass, and you can get flat pieces of glass, um, at least we can see from underneath what's happening. Come along with our other piece of material, put it face down. So, if I was to turn this upside down, and this was the polished face, we would now actually be looking at the material like this from the side. Here's the polish. Get it lined up, of which the next thing is how do you get your spacing correct? Because I'm drawing a straight line here, but you could have a really artistic piece. Uh, something like we saw here with all the letters inlaid, with the logo and some more letters. Um, got to be able to get it so it visually looks right. Um, and the way to do that is, of course, try to get a viewpoint from the underside and to use toothpicks. Uh, we used to take toothpicks and just put the toothpick in um, and use the toothpick to jam it in on the side so that we got the inlays positioned correctly relative to the other section of the stone. Once you've got it looking visually correct, dab it with some akimi. Um, so just come along and effectively just spot weld on the back there with some akimi. Take your toothpicks out, have a look and see that it still looks good. Make sure everything still is in good, you know, in position. Uh, depending on how fragile or if this was right across, we would then grind out a couple of grooves um, that might come right across, and we would then put a stainless steel rod in there. We would epoxy or akimi that into position and then come and fill this up with epoxy or uh, epi certainly epoxy this here and then fill the space up. Now you don't always have to fill the space up. If you've got a good support here, there's no real need to fill it up because when you put it back down, the grout is going to fill in here. But you might want to find some lower cost filler or if it's freezing outside, if this is a sign, we did a lot of signs, and it's now going to go vertical, the chance of water getting in the back there, sitting in there, freezing, expanding, and cracking your job is uh, pretty high if you didn't close it. Now, one of the things we haven't talked about is the gap here. People do a lot of inlays, and you can get inlays which are much closer together, and somewhere you might find the, co uh, the customer intentionally wants a bigger gap. If it's a bigger gap that's required, and it's a circle, it's, it's a circle in a square, and they want a really big gap here, for example, then you're going to have to have one program for the outside, another program for the inside, and you're going to have to make sure that your kerf, and by kerf I mean the width of the stream that's coming out of your cutting head, that's going to be typically 30 or 40 thousandths of an inch. <clears throat> so 
So if somebody wanted a hundred thousandths gap here, you're going to actually draw the part and you're going to have to make sure that this side of the stream is here and this side of the stream maybe is on the inside and you might have to actually do two parts and you're going to land up with a bigger gap. But typically, whenever you're doing artwork, <coughs> the easiest way to do it Especially if you are coming from a raster to vector scan. Somebody gives you a picture or a drawing, you scan it. Now it's a raster. You go through a vector conversion software program. There's many out there. We have some as well. Um, <clears throat> and it puts them into vectors. The challenge that you run into is if it breaks up, instead of giving you a circle, it gives you a whole lot of little lines because that's the way that it was scanned in, your program is going to become very big, it's going to be very cumbersome, and it, your computer is going to read every single segment, every single section, as another entity. And it's going to potentially start to have quite a few things happening, especially if some of those lines are doing this, and the machine's effectively shaking around. The best way to get rid of all sorts of curve compensation issues, and it's not a big deal with new controllers. Um, for example, you get a V like this, and you're coming along with your water jet stream. Uh, let's say we're coming down this side, so we come along here. Well, when we get to here, theoretically, our stream should go all the way to that position. But Obviously, that's going to screw up this part here. So that's where we want to be here. And somehow, we want the software to make sure that it never, ever goes beyond this. And this, of course, becomes round. It can never be a point. And that's another hint. Try to avoid absolute, infinitely sharp points because somebody will walk past with their high heels and snap this off when it's on the floor. And then your job looks bad. So make sure your points come like this, try to make them a little blunter as opposed to that where this could snap off here. Um, so the ideal way to do any artwork if you are scanning is to always run your water jet stream down the actual design and you use the same program for both colors. In other words you set your curve offset to zero. So if I had to cut this shape and it was going to be in a square I would take that program make sure it was set to zero I would run exactly the same program especially if uh, I was piercing on the line you can't if you're piercing here and there for the different halves but if you're piercing on the line I'd run exactly the same program and when you assemble it the gap between your materials is going to be the width of your water jet stream and when you have finished uh, putting this together upside down, you've got it strong enough, you've strengthened it, it's in a position where you can flip it up. You would flip this upside down, and now you can look at the face, you can see the names, you can see the logo, you can see whatever it is that you want to see. And you have your joints open. And we always used to encourage that when the installer put the floor in, whatever grout that was being used for the field, and for the entire surrounding area, they would at that stage come across and grout this, and as a result when you looked at the finished product it was the same color grout, the same kind of grout, and it looked like the whole thing was done in position as opposed to a lot of the complex inlays and uh, more intricate work being done on a water jet somewhere else. So there's a little bit uh, about doing some inlays.